the world began, ever inventive man has constantly pushed forward into the unknown. One by one, the frontiers of science have fallen before him. The science of speed, travel, radio. Now he stands on the threshold of a new age, a terrifying age. forward into the unknown. But how does the unknown react? The unknown planet. Planet X. Already, Dr. Laird. Right. Second A. Second A. Second B. Second B. All right, Gil. Get in GF2. Yes, sir. Gently. Gently. GF2, answer. Say as you fool. Get away from there. Oh, God, he's going oh, away. Oh, what happened, love? It all went white. Blinding love. That's the second time this week. It ain't right. Just because they have to muck about with the current for the sake of their blooming experiments, we have to suffer. Well, must be two. Eighteen quid, them new tubes cost. Who's going to pay me, I'd like to know, for two busts? Fred, the old clock stopped again. Good. <laughs> After that, I reckon we needs just one more. All right, it's this time. <coughs> Feeling all right now, love? Of course I'm all right. Don't fuss me. Oh, would you like a glass of water? Water? I want something stronger than that. I'm going to finish my drink. <laughs> Go on, Aunt. The things you say, you're better than any telly. Oh, you think so? <laughs> Shall we go? I don't mind. Come on, then. <laughs> it's a lovely night. Well, then, George, what's the idea, eh? What's up, then? What's up? Here's what's up. It's half past ten, and you're still serving drinks. That clock stopped again. Very convenient, that clock of yours, George. Very convenient. Time, gentlemen, please. Come along. You're well over time. Finish up your drinks, please. How is he, Dr. Lloyd? Sayers, he'll be all right. His hand is badly burnt. Means he'll be out of circulation for quite a while. Yes, the clumsy dote. Why did he want to go near GF2? He knew it might arc. 
Well, why does it, Art? Heaven knows. It could be the timing is wrong. Sayers never did get the timing right with this Yankee computer. Oh, sorry, Bill. It's all right. We could try a slightly higher frequency, but it's more likely to be eddy currents, and that'll mean more damping. Heaven knows what that'll cost. It'd be kind of a job changing those frequencies without Sayers' help. Impossible. We'll have to wait for another operator. I'll phone Wilson in the morning. They've got to let me have somebody. Morning, Wilson. Good morning, Brigadier. Please sit down. Thank you. I take it you've come about Laird. Yes, it's got to stop, Wilson. That will be your recommendation to the committee? Of course. Don't you agree? You're thinking of this business of Sayers. I'm thinking of the cost. By the way, I've replaced Sayers. The devil you have. Well, there's no alternative while the present set up lasts. We're committed to two assistants. Well, the sooner we close the whole project down, the better. Now, look, Wilson. I am just a plain, bone-headed brass hat. Oh, I wouldn't say that, Brigadier. You would, and you jolly well do, I know. It's true, anyway. But I do know when an experiment is successful, and I do know when it's costing the Earth, even though I don't fully understand it. I don't suppose there are more than half a dozen people who do understand precisely what it is that Laird is trying to achieve. Then why on Earth? As far as Laird is concerned, his work is pure research. Pure baloney. But the practical implications may well affect thinking on defence matters. That is why we are financially supporting the project. Financially supporting. Do you know how much money we've poured down that drain to date? A quarter of a million pounds. Can you justify that? Can Laird? Justify? Has anyone ever been able to justify pure research? At the time. Without it? No radio, no television, no radar, no guided missiles. Is Laird onto something like that? Laird is engaged on experiments which are aimed to study the changes, if any, in the nature and properties of metals, living tissues, and other materials when introduced into powerful magnetic fields. I know, I know, I can read. Sorry. If Laird can produce a magnetic field more powerful than any that has been produced before, if he can demonstrate that important changes do occur... Has he? Well, he's nearly bumped off Sayers and he's having trouble with his equipment. He was on the phone this morning. He's asking for more and more. More? Oh, this is preposterous. I'm going straight down there this morning to get to the bottom of this piece of folly. Well, it might be a good idea, Brigadier. Well, seriously, though, Laird tells me he's already had some limited success. You might check on that. I certainly will. Oh. I promised to send him this. Perhaps you would take it. What is it? A piece of metal. An alloy, such as used in aircraft. What's Laird supposed to do with that? You can tell him if you like. I'd love to. In that case, you'd better take this piece, too. I'd like to think that one experiment, at least, was some use to the country. Is this the same? Well, actually, no. I want a testing on both eventually. You're going straight away? Yes, this morning. Good. We have to soften the old boy up and his new assistant. It's a woman. A woman? Yes. I can hardly wait to tell him. Well, here we are. Oh, Gil, this is Brigadier Cartwright from the Ministry. How do you do, sir? How do you do? This is Gil Graham, Brigadier, my chief assistant. He's from McGill in Canada. Well, fine university. Thank you, sir. My other assistant was injured. We're expecting another one today. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry I've forgotten. I was to tell you your new assistant is a woman. A woman? You must be joking. Oh, he has to be joking. Well, I'm afraid not. There's no one else available to operate this computer of yours. But a uh, woman? This is preposterous. This is highly skilled work. She's very highly qualified, Doctor. Oh, yeah, I know the type. Frustrated, angular, spinster. Very dedicated to her calling. Without a sense of humor, bossy and infuriatingly right every time. Sorry, I know how you feel. Uh, I'm not having this. I'll go up and see Wilson. Uh, look, Doctor, don't you think you'd better show me what you brought me down here to see? Maybe you won't need an assistant soon. Very well. Bend this. This is a piece of copper. So is this. Bend it. But this is flexible, like steel. Precisely. Uh, Dr. Laird, I'll take these GF2 figures to your office. This is really most remarkable. It has had its molecules realigned in there. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was told to come down here. Who did you want to see? Dr. Laird. Are you... No, no, I'm Gilbert Graham, his assistant. Oh, I was told to report here. Well, he's right here in the laboratory. Oh, uh, 
Are you the, you the new comp operator, the replacement for Sayers? Yes, I am. I heard about Nicky Sayers. I'm terribly sorry. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Weren't you expecting me? Not exactly. You're, uh, you're French, aren't you? Yes, I am. Are you surprised? Very agreeably so. Thank you. I think that uh, Dr. Laird will be, too. How is he to work with? Oh, he's great, as long as you stand up to him. I see. Oh, Mr. Graham, can I have a word with you? Certainly. This is uh, Michelle DuPont, General Cartwright. How do you do? As soon as I see her in the Dr. Laird, I'll meet you up in the office. Yes. Excuse me. This business of altering the molecular structure of metals, has he got any defense angle? Well, if the molecular structure of the alloys used in building an aircraft were to be altered, the plane would probably crash. Remember the Comet 1. Oh, yes, yes, of course. But research of that nature into metal fatigue and all that sort of thing, that's already been carried on elsewhere. Well, not quite, sir. How do you mean? Well, our research may lead to the discovery of means to crash an enemy's aircraft. You're not suggesting, I take it, the enemy would allow us to cook his airplane alloys in that contraption of yours? Well, I don't think that would be necessary. Let me try to explain. Magnetism is a force, the only force other than gravity. It may be one and the same thing that operates over a distance. I see you have nine circuits in operation here, and only one in reserve. Is that not rather dangerous? This infernal machine has only ten circuits, and I need as many surges as I can get. The thing is supposed to compute and then fire the electrical impulses. I use a field of high intensity but short duration. I understand. Nevertheless, I think you should have at least three in reserve and one overriding spare. And I mean one not in actual use. That would give me only six charges, and it isn't enough. Oh, I see you do not understand this machine. Each circuit is capable of use over and over again. If it has a few microseconds to clear itself, that means you can have as many surges as you like in banks of three. Yes. Yes, of course. But do you mean that Laird could produce a magnetic field powerful enough to reach out beyond the machine, beyond the house? Well, from what the people down in the village are saying, he's done it already, spasmodically. But is it true? Do you think so? I don't know. Sometimes I wonder. Look here, Graham, be honest about this. It's important. Are you saying all this just to try and save the project? No, I'm not. I'm not at all sure I want to save it. Not if... Not if what? Well, there are dangers, the, the imponderables. Look, I've got a piece of airplane alloy here. Would Laird experiment on this, do you think? Well, if our new assistant can get the computer going, we might try it tonight. Let's go and find out. Uh, I wouldn't say anything to Dr. Laird about the effects over a distance. Not yet, anyway. Mm -hmm. Come in, Mr. DuPont. Gil? Gil, you were hopelessly wrong. Miss DuPont is brilliant and not at all bossy. She's not a bit frustrated, and I think she's quite good looking. Don't you? What do you think, Brigadier? Oh, I'm of your opinion, Doctor. Though I know nothing about computers. She's fixed it, Gil. We've got all the power we need. For the time being. That's fine. The Brigadier would like for us to cook this tonight. And why not? You'll stay and watch us? Yes, I think I will. It should be interesting. No. Jane! What do you mean, talking to that tramp? How dare you? He's nice. I met him in the wood yesterday. What? He likes insects, too. He's promised to give me a flea when he can catch one. I'll give you a flea. Come on in this minute. How many times have I told you not to speak to strange men? Tell me, what do you do for entertainment here? Entertainment? Yes. Well, uh, we have television. Of course, we don't have much time for that sort of thing. Once in a while, I combine my pleasures and watch it down at the village pub. Oh, I adore English pubs. Do you often go? Often as I can. Like to join me sometime? I'd love to. Good. But I warn you, though, we're uh, not very popular down there. No? Why? Well, they seem to think that some of our activities up here create some odd interferences in their TV and radio. Is it possible? Dr. Laird doesn't think so. And you? Do you think so? Could be. Is what we're doing dangerous? Not yet. <laughs> but then you were thinking of Sayers. No, I was not thinking of that kind of danger. That's to be expected. Yes. You know, I've been thinking, you don't have to stay here. I mean, you'll be going back to France pretty soon. Why not? 
I'm not scared, Mr. Graham. No, of course not. You know, we're all kind of, uh, well, as the English say, matey around here. Makes things easier. Think you can manage to call me by my first name? Gilles, isn't it? Gil. Oh. I saw your name in the letter you brought. Micheline? Michelle. Oh, that's it, Michelle, yes. I like that it suits you. You didn't answer my question. Well, about the danger? Yes. You see, I'm no expert in magnetic fields, but it just occurred to me this field Dr. Laird is using here, well, it's a very large field, isn't it? I mean, isn't it possible? Could it spread outwards? And Dr. Laird doesn't seem to worry. Laird. You're always telling me what Laird thinks or doesn't think. I'm asking you. I think you're a very clever young woman. Mm -hmm. I see. And Bossy? Oh, now, wait a minute. Frustrated? Look, Michelle, you're taking unfair advantage. I mean, uh, after all, I, I didn't know you then. What I mean is the female scientist types that I've always known were, uh, well, shall we say, different. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Well, I think we'll call the others. Oh, Michelle, uh, look, your letter of introduction, uh, what I mean is, is, uh, is there anything besides your name? Oh, yes. Bachelor of Science. Yeah, but... Uh, and Mademoiselle. Mademoiselle. Well, that do make it nice. That's American slang. It means that do make it nice. Oh. <laughs> well, Doctor, I'd like to get back tonight. Do you think we could start? Certainly, if that remarkable young lady has finished her work. Shall we go down? Oh, by the way, have you a watch? Yes. I should leave it here, if I were you. Watches are delicate mechanisms. They're best not taken too near magnetic fields. All metals in the lab are either non-magnetic or have been demagnetized. That's it. There's no danger, of course. All right, Gill, switch on the recorder. We record everything, Brigadier. It's useful for checking later. But surely tapes are magnetic. You're very smart, Miss Dupont. You're quite right. Now, we don't use tapes. We have a microphone, and we record on disc in the next room. Switch on the generators, Gil. I'll take the circuits. With Dr. Lerner. Over here, Brigadier. Yeah. Do sit down, Brigadier. Thank you. Computer? Computer on. Circuit B on. Integrate. Integrating. Then. Ready, Gil? All set, sir. Right. Steady now. GF2. Gently. Gently. GF2 over. Three banks under reserve in operation, Doctor. Good. Switching off power! Look out, Michelle! What the 
devil are you doing? Good heavens. Are you hurt? No, I don't think so. I'd be the rough game. Oh, I'm sorry it was the only thing to do. What happened? I don't know. I'm sorry. It was my fault. I left my keys in there. That was very careless of me. You seem to have been successful, Doctor. Look! What's that? Starters, ascenders! All the ladies! You Big storm on the south coast! Starters, ascenders! Big storm on the south coast! All the ladies! Now, let's see. Uh, yes, quote. Is space travel... No, no, unquote, unquote. Ah, uh, yes, uh, let's see. Yeah, quote. Could they invade us, unquote? Yeah, something like that. Then we'll carry a follow-up on page three with readers' letters. Well, they'll have seen hundreds of ruddy flying saucers by the time we're through with them. Okay. Who exactly is invading us, Mars? Eh? Oh, oh, no, they won't like that. Who, the Martians? Um, idiot, no, the, um... Look, make it, make it, uh... Yes, that's it, Planet X. The invasion from Planet X. That was some of your old old farce, if you don't mind my saying, sir. Yesterday, you were all folding up poor old Lair. Today, you tell the committee. <laughs> Look, Wilson, I couldn't say all I wanted to in front of the committee. Hey, they're supposed to be in the picture. They have to decide. Now, the picture's it's... changed. This affair's too big for the committee to handle. They are security risks. I, I'm afraid I don't quite follow. You showed us the alloy, and I'll admit it was most impressive, but we knew something of this before. I showed you in the committee one piece of alloy, the piece Lair put into his apparatus. Now, this is the other piece you gave me. Look. Now, that remained in this case during the whole experiment. It, and the case, and the hook it is hanging from, ended up by flying right across the laboratory and almost injuring the new assistant. Not another one. Oh, she's all right, thanks to Gil Graham. But don't you see, this wasn't in the confounded witch's cauldron. I see. Do you? Look at this. That fell off the TV aerial on Laird's roof. It's a different alloy, but it's gone the same way as the rest. At least 30 feet away from the apparatus. You know what you're saying, don't you? Yes. Action at a distance, the military's dream. Look, Wilson, from now on, this is top security. All right. Well, we'd better call in Jimmy Murray in that case. Yes, I think we'd better. Come in. Hiya, how are you feeling? Broken neck would feel worse, I guess. Do you always take your female assistants to a low-flying tackle like that? Depends on the mood. When I'm away from an intense magnetic field, my technique's a little different. I should hope not. You didn't come here to demonstrate, did you? It might be kind of interesting. Help yourself. Thanks. No, as a matter of fact, Michelle, I, I have something else on my mind. Can't say I'm sorry. What's the trouble? Before I grabbed you last night, I switched off the power from the generators. Yes? That should have shut the whole machine off at once. Well, it did, surely. Laird was pretty furious. Think back for a minute, Michelle. Must I? Please. Okay. After we hit the floor, the, the briefcase flew across the room into the computer. Correct. GF2 was arcing then. Right. Well, how the devil could that be? With the, the current off, the whole contraption should have been dead. That's right. But There's another thing, too. Of course, that screaming noise. Yeah, well, then I'm not crazy. You do remember. Yes. The circuits continued to operate after I'd switched off the power. But, Gil, what are we saying? This is completely ridiculous. You couldn't have switched it off. Yes, I did. I checked the switch this morning. There was no current flowing from the generator when GF2 arced, when that briefcase flew across the room, and while the circuits continued to scream. There's one way of checking. How's that? The recording. Of course. What's the matter with me? Come on. <gasps> Wait. What? What's the matter? I'm still creaking. Let me give you a hand. Thanks. You don't look all that fragile, you know. This is the bit. Listen. Switching off power. Look out, Michelle. 
Well? Gil, what does it mean? I don't know. That apparatus was receiving power from someplace, somehow. The storm, maybe. No, that's absurd. Not very likely. Gil, I'm scared. Yeah, well, so am I, Michelle. So Laird's Circus gets top security rating. That's about it, Jimmy. Well, if you both think so. Don't you? Frankly, Brigadier, I just don't register yet. What you've been telling me sounds well. I know, I know. But you must take my word for it at the moment. Okay. But what with you and Laird, freak storms and the press going to town about flying saucers and invasions from Planet X, I'm beginning to feel like Dan Dare. Am I likely to meet a little green horrors with eyes on the ends of their whiskers? I don't think that at all likely. Though you may meet some characters with snow on the boots, if you know what I mean. Yes, I know. And you know we've had a call from Air Force security saying that three of their radar stations report sighting some unidentified object. Do you think there's any connection between this and Laird's work? I don't know. I just don't know. But we must take every possible precaution. You and Wilson travel down separately. Okay. Wilson will supervise the ordering and delivery of Laird's new equipment and it's going down in plain vans. Watch it, Murray. I will. And remember, Wilson, you must impress on Laird the importance of a wide margin of safety this time. Laird seems to be a tricky customer to give advice to. He is. In fact, he's more than tricky. He's... Oh, well, I suppose you must make some allowance for genius. They work in close touch with Graham. I'm pretty sure he's aware of the risk. And they must understand the whole aim of the project now is to make the force directional. Right, sir. Keep in touch, and the best of luck. That fence will work. It's caustic enough. Yeah, it should. Form an anti-magnetic screen. Particularly ugly one. There ought to be a law about corrugated iron. Another lorry load of gubbins arriving. You know, this is getting a bit ridiculous. Besides, creating a condenser to make it look like a sideboard is darned expensive. <laughs> Better go down and check it in. Right. Oh, Gerald, when you're finished, I'd like to have a private word with you. Okay, I'll be back. Smith, are you her husband? No. Good. I hate her. She threw my bugs away. The bugs? Mm. She called them insects, of course. She's very stupid. And uh, weren't they insects? Some were. You see, all insects are bugs, but all bugs are not insects. And is that what you were doing just now, collecting bugs? What were you doing? Oh, nothing. Um, at least, <laughs> I was just trying to find my way. My goodness, are you lost? Yes. Fancy getting lost in Briarley Woods? Is this Briarley Woods? Of course it is. Everyone knows that. Are you a foreigner? You look like one. You've got funny whiskers. Yes, I suppose I am. At least I came here from a long way off. What's so funny about my whiskers anyway? I haven't seen anyone else with funny whiskers like that. Well, perhaps I'd better shave them off then. I don't want to look funny or different from anybody else. How did you get here? If I told you, you wouldn't believe me. I would, you know. Even if I said I came on the back of a giant dragonfly? Oh, no. There aren't any giant dragonflies. There are where I come from. There aren't any giant dragonflies anywhere. What about on the moon, then? Oh, well, if you come from the moon, that's different. Where are you staying? I don't know. As a matter of fact, I'm looking for somewhere to stay. I expect we could have put you up at our house. Only there's a new lodger coming today. I don't think I shall like her. Her name's Forsyth and she's going to be the new teacher at our school. Is there anywhere else around here I may be able to stay? I don't suppose they'd put you up. They're very narrow-minded. Oh, of course. Are there any big places around here, you know, factories, workshops, anything like that? Nothing like that. Only Dr. Laird's house, of course. But it's no good going there. He's a mad inventor. And what does he invent? It's a secret. No one knows. Well, I must go home. Why is Dr. Laird mad? 
Almost every night he switches on his machine and busts off all the television sets. Where does he live? It's no good. He won't take lodgers. You can see his house from the top of the hill. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now, let me get this straight. What you're trying to tell me, as I see it, is that this fearsome contraption of yours went on working after you'd cut off the current. Is that it? That's it. I speak from unfathomable depths of ignorance, but is that so very remarkable? Of course it is. If I switch off, say, an electric fan, wouldn't it go on turning for a while, momentum or something? Yeah, but you wouldn't uh, get an electric shock from the terminal. Our circuit, GF2, we call it, arced across about five seconds after I switched off the power. That's impossible. That's what I keep telling myself and Dr. Laird. What did he say? Same as you did. Impossible. Refuses to listen. There's more to it than that, too, Gerald. You know, I'm not the brains of this joint, but I've been figuring a few things out during the past ten days. That apparatus was building up a field far in excess of anything that we could have reasonably expected from the power we were feeding into it. Personally, I think you're all getting slightly neurotic over this business. Did you say you had a recording of the session? That's right. You ought to hear it. Hmm. It's funny. It's gone. This looks like a case for Jimmy Murray. Where is he? On his way down from London. I promised to meet him for a pint in the Crown of Mitre this evening. You better come too. Yeah. Uh, shall I bring Michelle? Not necessary. She's coming. I asked her this morning. I want to start getting up earlier. <laughs> Where do you live? Well, I'm going to Briley Bay. I'm a teacher. I started the school there on Monday. Briley Bay? Well, after we've reported this to the police, I'll take you there. Please sit down, Miss Murray. Thank you, Inspector. We're taking a statement from Miss Forsyth now. I understand you're taking her on to her lodgings at Briley Bay. Yes, I'm staying there myself at Dr. Laird's establishment. Inspector, what are you going to do about this man? Well, we'll comb the woods, of course. But first, let me ask you a question. Do. I don't say I shall be able to reply. <laughs> I know you security chaps. But this is important. You see, a man has been seen in the woods. And it's been reported that he has a large burn mark on his face. Tell me, has Laird been using radioactive materials? I can tell you that, Inspector. The answer is no. Definitely no. Thank you, sir. Well, we'll have to try another line of approach. Come in. Miss Forsyth's ready now, sir. Right, just coming. Well, goodbye, Inspector. Uh, goodbye. And thank you very much for all your help. What about another drink? Not for me, thanks. Hmm? Pass. Oh, do you mind if I 
Gino. You're very quiet, Gil. What's on your mind? No, nothing. Everything. You mean you feel come see come up? Yes. How long you known Gerald? Why? Does it matter? <coughs> Sorry. Didn't mean to interfere or intrude. I don't want to quarrel with you, Gil. Cheers. What about Osante? You know where that man Murray is? He was supposed to meet us here. What do you have, sir? What's that? Oh, no, Bob's. Mild and bitter. I'll have that. Certainly. That elfin music you hear comes from a proper band. At last. Sorry, I'm late. Okay. Meet Michel Dupont and Gil Graham. How do you do? Oh, yeah. How'd What's you do? the trouble? Things have been happening. There's a maniac at large in the woods. A what? There you are. Nice of you to take me dancing. What are all the pretty girls going to do now? They haven't got Jean Kelly to dance with. Nurse their perishing corns. I haven't been long. Oh, no. You were going to get me a drink half an hour ago. I thought you were going to have a nice cup of tea. Tea? Get me a glass of nourishing stout. All right, love. Evening out. Hey, to Mrs. Packer. Hey, to Mr. Graham. Oh, hello, all right. Where's Jillian? Isn't she here? I haven't seen her. Well, you see, I was supposed to be working late tonight, and, well, she said she'd meet me here. You are. Well, that's women for you. Can't let them out of your sight. <laughs> Never mind, I'll have a drink. I expect Gillian's had to wait till her dad's got home. She suspects hasn't been too well lately. No, I have. Uh, I think I'll stroll down the lane and see if I can meet her. microphone was too near the loudspeaker. A syndrome. That's it. That's what was the matter. We had a syndrome in the, in the magnetic field. You all right, old boy? What the dickens you babbling about? You understand, don't you, Michelle? Yes, I believe I do. Would you mind explaining? You know, have you both gone crazy? Did you hear that screech from the loudspeaker? I'm not deaf. Yeah, well, look. The microphone was too near to the speaker. The sound goes in, it comes out louder. Back into the microphone and around and out louder still, and so on and so on. It's called a syndrome. You mean a sort of vicious circle? <laughs> That's right. And if you don't put a stop to it, it keeps piling up and piling up until the amplifier or some part of the circuit goes bust. I get it. But why all the dramatics? Have you got your car here? Yes, why? I want to get back to the lab. What, now? I've got to see Dr. Laird right away. You do understand, don't you, Michelle? Yes, I do. I think you ought to go. But can't you tell us what all the excitement's about? I'll try and explain. You must go. You'll be all right, won't you? Of course. Come on, let's go. Uh, Gerald, I'm sorry, but this is important. Gil, I hope you know what you're talking about. So do I. Let's be practical, my boy. You make an excellent theoretical case for the build-up in the field being syndromic, but where exactly in the circuit does the phenomenon occur? Well, as I see it, it's between these two circuits. You have a first-class brain, Gil. It's a pity that you allow your imagination to run away with it. Meaning what? Meaning that in the first place, you have reached the correct conclusion from the wrong premise. Well, I don't understand. Secondly, that you are allowing the self-evident fact to scare you. You were driven to your clever piece of reasoning by worrying about a lot of silly tittle tattle freak storms and the like. Haven't you considered the possibility that we might have caused some of the things which took place that night? I never consider anything which might interfere with my research. Seems rather short-sighted, doesn't it? If one always stopped to calculate the risks, there would be no research. But you think I'm right about the syndrome. I know you're right. I reached the same conclusion over a week ago. Well, but you said nothing to Because I knew you would be all for delay. Well, wouldn't that be the wiser course, Dr. Laird? I don't think so. We have accidentally stumbled upon the secret of producing an enormously more powerful magnetic field than we had ever hoped for. We have saved ourselves years of work, and you want to throw those years away. No, I don't want to do that. I just feel that we ought to proceed with the utmost caution. We have new equipment, more powerful generators, but the same circuits. We have taken great precautions. The iron fence, for instance, the direction field, better insulation, and the screening between the terminals of GF2. Yes, well, as I see it, the screening of the GF2 terminals is the main danger. It's like, uh, like putting a six-inch nail across a five-amp house fuse. Perhaps you would allow me to be the best judge of that. 
I've been engaged in this work all my life. Well, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to sound impertinent. Uh, not impertinent, just frightened. And a frightened assistant is no good to me. If you would care to terminate your appointment here. Of course not. I, I wouldn't think of deserting you at this stage of the game in any case. Please do not allow questions of personal loyalty to affect you. Under the circumstances, I wouldn't. I was thinking more of the complicated operation of the apparatus. It's not so complicated now, you know. It would be possible for only one person to operate. Yes, sir. Julian! 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 Closed. Yes, sir. The dance goes on till midnight. It's getting very late. Is it that I'm positively repulsive, or could there be someone else? I'm afraid there is. I'm sorry. I just realized it now. You? Please, let's go. Lucky devil. Ah, Miss Dupont, you going? Yes, why? It's Gillian Betts. They, uh, they just found out. Is young Art here? Well, what's happened, an accident? No, sir, not an accident. Murder. Murder? Where was this? In Briarley Woods, sir. He's a maniac. Yeah, are you quite Sorry, sure? Sir, I can't say any more. No. Of course not. Darling, you all right? Yes, but can't we go? You are together, sir? Yes. And you have a car? Oh, yes. And that'll be all right. Well, you see, we haven't found the fellow yet. And what about you, sir? Are you with the... No, officer. I'm alone. You're going past Briarley Woods. I don't think you ought to be by yourself, sir. Well, could I give you a lift? Thank you. Not at all. My car's outside. Good night, miss. Good night, sir. Good night. I'll warn the others upstairs. Right. Where shall I drop you, Mr. Um... Smith? If you could drop me at the other end of the village near Dr. Laird's house. Oh, yes, we're going that way. Thank you. I'm just thinking. That young man went to meet Gillian. Don't you think we should tell the police? Yes, of course. I'll go back in and tell him. Will you forgive me if I take this opportunity of speaking to you? What is it? I overheard what Mr. Graham said tonight about syndromes. Well? You see, I understand something of your work. How much? Who are you, anyway? That is not important. I must speak to you and Mr. Graham as soon as possible. It will have to be tomorrow after we've finished our work at the lab. Very well. Shall we say here at 6 o'clock? All right. OK, I told him. Let's go. Did he give you any clue as to why he wanted to meet you and Gil? Not really, but he seemed to know a lot about our work. You didn't tell him anything? Of course not, Jimmy. I'm not that stupid. Well, I don't like it. I just don't like it. Who is this chap, Smith? Know anything about him, Gerald? Not a thing. Gil? I saw him for the first time tonight at the dance. Gerald, when you took him in the car tonight, did he say where he lived? No, he just told me to drop him near here. Yes, he said it was okay to drop him here. That's right. He must be staying in the village. Well, that should make it easy for us to keep tabs on him. Gil, Michelle, you must meet him tomorrow evening, as arranged. What's the drill? See if he tries to pump you about Laird's work. Find out all you can. Right. How did Laird react to your inspiration, Gil? Well, the syndrome? <laughs> he guessed it already. Oh, that's tough. Is he going to foul things up? Nope. He's pressing on regardless. You're worried, aren't you? I am. I'm in a bit of a fix. I, I don't like to go behind the old man's back. But I think we're moving along a little too fast. <clears throat> That apparatus is ready to work, but nobody knows for sure what it'll do. Doesn't Laird know? You try asking him. I almost got sacked tonight. Oh, no, Gil. Would you like me to contact Cartwright? Well, I think we should in any case. But he better not come here, not with Laird in his present mood. I agree. Well, then. Well, police headquarters. Poor old Inspector Burns ought to be put more in the picture. We may need his help yet. Just you say, Jimmy. I'll phone Cartwright in the morning. I'll meet him at the station in the car. Well, if there's nothing else, I'm for bed. Would you mind? Oh, yes. Coming, Jimmy? Hmm? Oh, yes. I'll see you two before you meet Smith. Good night. All right, good, good night. night. Good night. 
I'm, uh, I'm sorry about tonight. I didn't mean to butt in. It isn't really any of my business. Isn't it, Kiro? After you've gone, Gerald kissed me. Why tell me? I'm not enjoying it. Neither did I. Funny, isn't it? Well, it's too bad. I'm sorry. Are you really? Not really. I enjoyed that. <laughs> so did I. Hello. Hello. Feeling better? Yes, much better, thanks. This is Jane. I'm staying at her house for the time being. She's taking me to see the school. I'm going to catch a beetle for her. They're horrid looking. I'm terribly thrilled about that. <laughs> when does school start? On Monday. I've got the key from the head so I can look around my classroom and get everything ready. You look like being busy. What with beetles and school. Look, I'm rather tied up today, but I thought of taking a boat out tomorrow, Sunday. When did you think about that? Just a moment ago. I can't think why. Do you have to come? I'd love to. Well, I must fly now. Got to meet my chief off the train. Oh, by the way, Jane, ever met a man called Smith in the village? No, but I met a Mr. Smith in the woods. What? He's nice. He helps me look for insects. Oh, well, if you meet him again, try and find out where he lives, will you? I can't. So that's our school, Jane. You going in, Miss Forsyth? Yes, I must. Oh, well, if you must. And you? I'm going to look for that beetle larva. All right, but don't be late home. You promised your mother. I won't. Goodbye. A lot of bears here, George. Yes, sir. There we are, thanks. That's right, thanks, sir. All right, Mr. Smith. Shoot. I'll come straight to the point, Mr. Graham. I overheard your conversation last night, and that led me to suppose that you were concerned with Dr. Laird's experiments. Oh, I see. And what's your interest in those experiments? Will you accept for the moment that it is purely scientific? Go on. I take a great interest in the subject of magnetic fields, Mr. Graham. Why not? What's that got to do with Dr. Laird's experiment? Will you also accept that I'm not a complete fool? All right. Thank you. Dr. Laird is no doubt a very clever man. He must be to have built an apparatus capable of recently causing such atmospheric disturbance. However, I suspect he is also a single-minded man and possibly an unimaginative one. Mr. Graham, the Earth has a magnetic field. Have you considered the dangers of upsetting that field? It has happened before in history, you know, with catastrophic results. Yes. Yes, I've considered the possibility. You seem to be a remarkably well-informed man, Mr. Smith. Please go on. There is also another danger. The danger of radioactive rays. Well, we're not using any radioactive materials. I know that. But not all radioactive particles are man-made. There is another source. Yes, that's true. They're cosmic rays. They bombard us constantly, but they, they do little apparent harm. Because you are shielded from all but the harmless ones by the ionosphere, the, the so-called heavy side layer. The heavier rays, the sodium, for example, never normally reach the Earth. Yes, that's true, but, uh, but I don't quite follow you. Mr. Graham, the ionosphere could be affected by magnetism. It could be bent or fractured. But surely the ionosphere is 50 or 60 miles up. And ships at sea 80 miles away were affected by your experiment. Don't you see? If at the points of maximum strength of your field, the heaviside layer had been temporarily fractured or pulled down close to the Earth, heavy and possibly dangerous cosmic rays could have reached the Earth's surface and may have affected many people in strange ways. How do you mean? I mean they may have been driven mad. The human beings who may have been affected by the rays will probably all die, though not before they may have killed many people. But there is something else. It would normally take many years for any change to become apparent in the human race or in animals with a long gestation period. But what of the quick breeders, the insects? Insects? Oh, mon dieu, no! Yes. Some insects, ants, spiders, could already have mutated. In what way? That is impossible to say. They could have become a different species, they could have become smaller, or much larger.
Look, some of my colleagues are in a conference now at the police station. Would you come along with me and state your case to them? No, Mr. Graham, I'd rather not. But why not? There are reasons. Besides, they would probably regard me as a crank. Well, I, I don't. I hoped you wouldn't. That's why I chose to speak well, then, to you. please. No, Mr. Graham, the responsibility rests with you now. I can only wish you success. Miss Dupont. Well, Gil, what do you think? I think you may be right, Michelle. Look, I, I want to go see Cartwright. Can you make it home all right alone? Of course. Darling, make them believe you. I know you can be very persuasive when you want to. Right. Excuse me, miss. Being as you're a scientist, I wish you'd look at what our Jane's found. I rang the police, but they didn't say much, and, well, I don't like the look of it. Do you have something to boil this in? Well, yes, I have. You boil it immediately. Boil it, miss, but... Please, Mrs. Hill, don't argue. You boil it. You understand? You boil it. It's very dangerous. And incidentally, you lock your door and close all your windows and keep everybody inside. But what about Miss Forsyth? Who is Miss Forsyth? My new lodger, the new school teacher. She's still out. She went to the school this afternoon. Where is the school? Well, the quickest way is through the woods. There's a path opposite. Don't worry. I'll find Miss Forsyth. The whole idea is utter nonsense. The chap's trying to scare us off. I'm surprised at you, Gil. I'm inclined to agree. I certainly think this man Smith needs pulling in for further questioning. Do you know anything about him, Inspector? Not a thing. But then there are quite a lot of Smiths about. Exactly. He's too good to be true. Who is he? Where does he come from? I can't get a lead on him anywhere. All the same, I agree with Graham. We must hold up all further experiments with Laird's apparatus until a thorough checkover has been made. All right, that's agreed. Excuse me, gentlemen. Inspector Burns here. Yes? What? Art Deverson's been found. Dead. Mutilated. Oh, my. His body was clean dry of blood. You see, Smith was right. It's those insects. They mutated and they're hungry. Oh, come on. Shut up, will you, Jimmy? Inspector, Brigadier, you've got to cordon off those woods. Insects are tremendous eaters. There won't be anything left for Every there. available man. Graham's right. Look, give me that telephone. This is a military operation. Get me the nearest army depot. I'll phone him. He can have a word with Laird. Yes, son? Well, sir, I didn't think he was important at first, but now... Well? Well? Mrs. Hale, sir. She rang up to say her daughter had found a whopping great egg. What was that? An egg, sir. Who said that? Mrs. Hale, sir. And she said that her lodger, a Miss Forsyth, was out late. Oh, no. Does she know where she went? She was at the village school, sir. you quit Riley School!
light. There's another girl in the woods. Who is it? From a dog to Laird's assistant. Michelle! Gil, come back. Mr. Graham. Michelle, she's in here. I'll come with you. Hurry. What is it? What is it? I've just had a message from Brigadier Cartwright, Dr. Laird. Oh, I can't be bothered with you or Cartwright just now. I'm sorry, Doctor. This is important. So is this. Much more important than anything Cartwright has to gossip about. And I'm nearly ready for testing. It's about that. You mustn't operate the machine. I mustn't operate my own apparatus. Did you say that... I'm afraid I did. Some entirely new factors have arisen which make it imperative that all testing should be indefinitely delayed. Indefinitely delayed? How easily Whitehall bureaucrats betray red tape fetters? Indefinitely delayed. There will be no delay, Mr. Wilson. I alone am competent to decide when the separator shall be tested. Not some two-penny brass hat or upstart civil servant. Now get out! Dr. Laird, don't be ridiculous. Put that gun down. You're behaving like a madman. Nobody wants to interfere. Get out! If you say another word, I'll shoot you. Do you understand? I'll shoot you. Please listen. This apparatus has cost lives. It is dangerous. <laughs>
Feeling better, Michelle? You're going to be all right, Michelle. Well, I think we've covered this section of the woods, Mr. Muddy. I wouldn't like that job again. Any casualties? It's a good job we acted when we did. The woods were thick with eggs. Another few days and we've... Yes, all right. There's to be no relaxing. Keep patrolling all night and tomorrow we'll have a thorough comb out. You better report to Brigadier Cartwright straight away. Right, sir. Good Lord. To think we have to do this in every wood in the country. That will not be necessary, Mr. Murray. Hmm? Mr. Smith, one or two questions I'd like to ask you. Where do you come from? Uh, Jimmy, I, I'm afraid that's going to be a kind of an awkward question for him to answer, isn't it, Mr. Smith? Yes, indeed. Uh, you said that some of the RAF boys had reported unidentified objects flying south. Yes, that's right. Usual sort of nonsense. Yes, well, this time it wasn't nonsense, I'm afraid. Was it, Mr. Smith? I landed here shortly after your first disastrous experiment. Landed? What are you talking about? This is difficult. Let me put it this way, Mr. Murray. Without being aware of it, your newspapers were very near the truth when they spoke of mysterious invaders from Planet X. Am I going crazy? In fact, there was but one invader. It was I. Jimmy, I, I realize it's going to be a little hard for you to believe, but the truth of the matter is, Mr. Smith is the legendary character from outer space. Right? Get me Brigadier Cartwright. Hurry. Cartwright here. Cartwright? Wilson here. Listen. Laird gone mad. What's that? No. Don't talk. Listen. He shot me. Come. Quick. Heaven's sake, come. He's alone. We've had your planet under close observation for many years. Flying saucers? That's what you've chosen to call our spacecraft. We've also been monitoring your radio. That's how I come to speak passable English. But you, you're like us. Is that so very surprising, Miss Forsyth? There are many planets with the same physical conditions as here on Earth, and on them life has gone through the same evolutionary processes. Where is this planet X? If I were to tell you, you would neither understand nor believe me. Time and space are still the great mysteries to you. Why have you come to pay us this visit? Because of your experiments in magnetism. You brought down one of our spacecraft on the night of your experiment. Our craft used the planetary lines of magnetic attraction as their means of propulsion. That's why we were so concerned with your experiments. Alarmed, I might say. We had to act in what you would call enlightened self-interest. Is that the only reason that you came? No. We've never interfered with your development before. But this time, your entire planet was in danger. It still is, if you continue with your experiments. You mean we might reverse the Earth's polarity, tilt the Earth on its axis? Yes, I do. It has happened before, but then the force was extraterrestrial. I thought you said there was no further danger from these insects. That is correct. We were able to calculate the center of disturbance and the points of maximum intensity. This, I assure you, is the only place on land to be affected by cosmic ray bombardment. On land? There were some areas in the sea. There, life will have been spontaneously created, microscopically, just as it was millions of years ago, before there was an ionosphere to protect you. You've had a very narrow escape, Mr. Graham. Well? Message from Brigadier Cartwright, sir. Will you and Mr. Graham come down to Dr. Laird's house immediately? What's happened? It's Mr. Wilson, sir. He's been shot. Gerald, shot? Is he... We're afraid he's dead. Dr. Laird seems to have gone mad, and the Brigadier's worried he may start his machines again, sir. I was afraid of this. We gotta stop him. Let me come with you. Just like I thought. Locked and bolted. We could break it down, I suppose. Well, we might, but it'd be a tough job to take ours. Oh, that will be enough to set him off. Look here, Smith. Can you help us? Do you really want me to? Of course we do. Smith, there's very little time left. If Laird switches on that infernal machine, 
Well, I understand you know more about these things than we do. I do, sir. We must stop him. Can you help us? Look, how about that, that gun thing, the one you used to kill the spider with? No. I can help you, but the decision for what I do must be yours. Go on. It is a question of one man's life, or perhaps the very existence of the Earth. That's not a difficult decision. For us, it would be. Life is more simple for you. Your press has spoken of our world as Planet X. We, too, have the equivalent of X in our language. Our children learn in their schools about the strange world of Planet X. You mean, uh... Yes. Yours is the strange world, Mr. Graham. Brigadier, if I were to destroy this machine, would you promise me not to rebuild it? I give you my word. Without Laird, I don't think we could. Right, Graham? Absolutely right. Very well. I want you to take your men away from the house. Well away. What are you going to do? Mr. Graham, Mr. Paul, would you come with me, please? There it is.